Also, Lona Koifoid Hansen. Um, thank you very much. I am Jeff Bardzell, uh, and I'm pleased to present our work, Immodest Proposals, today on behalf of uh, colleagues Shawan Bardzell and Lona Koifoid Hansen. This thing is right in my face. Um, uh, the HCI and design communities have been thinking about research through design for two decades, asking questions like these In what senses can a design or a design practice be research? Who makes and who knows RTD's knowledge outcomes? And the HCI design communities have offered many responses to this question. Here we offer a very incomplete inventory of such responses. An RTD embodies knowledge in an artifact that cannot be verbally paraphrased. It shifts our perspective on a situation by designing something for it. It reifies an argument. It offers speculative proposals of alternative futures, and so on. We begin unpacking our response to this question by exploring three aspects of how re knowledge unfolds from designs as research. Knowledge is unfolded in objects, in the interpretation of objects, and in interpretive communities. A classic formulation of this first aspect can be found in Frayling, who wrote, uh, research through design is a form of inquiry where the, where the end product is an artifact, where the thinking is, so to speak, embodied in the artifact, where the goal is not primarily communicable knowledge in the sense of verbal communication. And this dense little passage has a lot of implications. Some of these have been worked out in Gaber's work. He writes, an endless string of design examples is precisely the core of how design research should operate. And the role of theory should be to annotate those examples rather than replace them. So there's two claims being made here. Design is or can be a knowledge medium. And design's embedded knowledge is resistant to and even superior to any verbal paraphrase of it. So what do these imply for practice? We Berg and Stoltemann write that a concept design contains, quote, all the combined knowledge that has influenced the design. If so, that's a lot to unpack. And that leads us to the second aspect of not how knowledge unfolds from or within HCI, uh, sorry, research through design, uh, and that is that it's unfolded in the interpretation of objects. We motivate the second point by analogy. We know that facts don't speak for themselves. For something to register as a fact requires a holistic view of reality, a body of theory, a collection of related other facts, a shared sense of what are the questions and what are the reasons that we're asking them, and above all, a community to which these are common. And this level of discourse is predominantly verbal. So it should likewise be obvious that designs don't speak for themselves for much the same reasons. And so we end up with a productive tension between designs as saying more than and being more core than their surrounding texts and designs as not saying anything at all without those texts. Navigating this productive tension, there must be knowing subjects of the design and its situ situ uh, situatedness in a synoptic body of theory, a sense of reality, a collection of other relevant designs and practices. There are as many different types of knowing subjects as there are possible stakeholders in a research through design. This includes the designer of that research through design project who is pursuing, who is pursuing certain inquiry objectives and members of the research community who are pursuing their own re uh, research objectives. An RTD's designer might use the knowledge gained th through the, this activity generatively pr to pursue future design in a given space, to write up research papers, to produce annotated portfolios, and so forth. Likewise, the research community also produces knowledge uh, based on, on these designs. These include acts of design criticism, thematic design studies, the construction of theory, and so forth. And we're going to focus on the second group for several reasons. One is that it's not in the past gotten a lot of attention in HCI, but it is starting to. And second, HCI does not have and never will have a class of professional critics. So if we want this work done, we're going to have to do it ourselves. So what does it mean to take art or design seriously? Obviously, there's many ways to approach this question, but we're going to focus on two. Peter Paul Verbeek writes, artists can experiment with the politics of things. They draw attention to a matter, turn it into an experience, rewrite it, enable people to see through the political role of things and play with it. So the main significance of the work is not that it offers us a new theory of something, nor even any new facts. Rather, it helps us experience some aspect of reality in a new way to establish a different set of experiential relations to it. Gordon Graham writes, the question to be asked of a work is not, is this how it really was? <coughs> but rather, does this make us alive to new aspects of this sort of occasion? 
Yesterday I saw Leisha Palin's wonderful social impact award talk on crisis informatics. Throughout, she expressed a serious and systematic commitment to, is this how it really was questions? And it's easy to see why. If her research stumbles there, there could be dire consequences. But that is not the epistemic goal that Graham here is attributing to the work of art. Becoming alive to new aspects is not about representing reality through any level of theory. It is rather an, an enrichment of our perceptual and imaginative capabilities in concrete situations. So far, so abstract. What we want to do now is to read a design as knowledge unfolding. The design we've chosen is Hiromi Ozaki's menstruation machine. In reading it, we will reflect on how our reading both falls short of and also goes beyond that design and how both of these moves yields knowledge. So what we're asking is, how did our engagement with menstruation machine produce knowledge for us? And what do our reflections on the above questions suggest about RTD as knowledge? Menstruation machine is a 2010 design fiction by Hiromi Ozaki. The machine is a wearable device that simulates menstruation. She writes, it's 2010, so why are humans still menstruating? What does menstruation mean to humans? Fitted with a blood dispensing mechanism and lower abdomen simulating electrodes, the menstruation machine simulates the pain and bleeding of an average five-day menstruation process of a human. The menstruation machine is also a music video, and I'll show a clip of it in a moment. In it, a biological man cross-dresses. As a part of her preparation, in addition to makeup, a wig, and a nice outfit, she also puts on the menstruation machine. Let's take a look. Um, so with that introduction out of the way, let's, let's proceed. In research through design literature, it's common to refer to individual designs as proposals. So if we take that question very literally, what does a system like menstruation machine propose? One, menstruation is a design material. That is the materiality of menstruation measurable in milliliters of blood and the amount of force generated by muscle contractions can be used as raw materials out of which to make a design. Two, menstruation is desirable. Here the design fiction asks us to suspend our disbelief. Three, menstruation is gender portable. This move is opened up by the suspension of disbelief in number two. Four, menstruation is merely physiological. This reduction of the holistic phenomenon of menstruation to merely physiological issues is problematic. It leaves out the cultural meanings and implications of menstruation, including the social power of its stigmatization and its symbolic power, e.g. of the missed period. Five, medical devices should be designed for lifestyle and fashion. They shouldn't merely be ugly and functional. Six, techno technological innovation is sexist. The artist makes this argument herself, saying in an interview, quote, I wanted to illustrate how technology doesn't necessarily evolve fairly. Japan took more than 10 years to approve contraceptive pills, but only took six months to approve Viagra. Seven, a feminine performance is not real unless it has the possibility of menstruation. The video scenario clearly proposes that to be a kawaii cute girl is more than a merely visual performance. One also has to experience menstruation to quote, really, really know how it feels. Obviously one could generate a lot of these. We're gonna stop for now and see what we can and what we cannot do with this collection of proposals as a paraphrase of menstruation machine. One thing we can do is textually analyze our paraphrase for coherence and its connectedness to other discourses. So what we have begun here is that with a close reading of the device itself and the artist's statement and the accompanying video, and we've generated a set of proposals from this core. But it's clear right away that the design reaches outside of itself. Ozaki herself uses it to raise issues, for example, about the Japanese political system, and in calling it a design fiction, she situates her work in a particular tradition of design research. Meanwhile, it also generates a public response ranging from our classrooms to the media. We also consulted health sciences and cultural studies of menstruation as interpretive frames. But it doesn't stop there, because the design resonates with, or seems to connect with other discourses, other ideas, other significances. That is, when we experience the design's matter, when we become alive to the issues that it is raising, it prompts us to look further for new resources, new connections in our experience. 
inevitably and intuitively, we begin to ask how these different frames speak to and across one another. If we consider the two bolded items on this slide, for example, we can ask, how do medical devices reflect cultural attitudes towards the body? Or we could connect these two to ask, how does menstruation machine orientalize its deconstruction of gender? Or we can ask, how does this design help us think about gender binaries and essentialism? And this question became especially interesting to the three of us. Does modern techno science have the power to disrupt the gender sex system? Should it? So we pursued that question further. Let's return to proposals three and seven from the earlier uh, part of this talk in this regard. Proposal three does not commit menstruation machine to an essentialist position because it reduces menstruation to measurable physiology which can be enacted on anyone's body. This move is gender non-essentialist because with it anyone, any gender, any age can experience menstruation. But proposal seven does commit menstruation machine to an essentialist position because according to it, in order to be subjectively real, a feminine performance has to have, as a necessary if not sufficient condition, the experience of menstruation during it. Now, if this design fiction were the type of verbal discourse one normally finds in research, for example at this conference, we'd have a big problem with it. It's self-contradicting. But this is not a logical or intellectual failure of menstruation machine. Instead, these contradictions are part of what Martin Seal calls the work's constitutive indeterminacy. This is stronger than ambiguity. It is the claim that not only can certain objects' meanings never be pinned down, but that they make this indeterminacy present to our awareness and help us see it in other things. So we return now to the questions that motivated our analysis. How did our engagement with menstruation machine produce knowledge for us? It prompted us to contemplate actively a series of questions and connections that are relevant to our disciplinary work as it is concretely situated for us. What do our reflections on the above questions suggest about research through design as knowledge? Its uniquely indeterminate clusters of constraints and openings established a dialogic structure with our own thinking in which each reads the other. And that brings us all the way back to some of the responses that we surveyed earlier uh, about how design does research. Specifically, we want to turn to this idea that as design reifies an argument. We tried very hard to make menstruation machine reify an argument. We expected to fail, and we did fail. Uh, if a design were a reified argument, it would be paraphrasable as that argument. But we ended up with several internally incoherent arguments, and a point that we develop, a point that we develop more in more detail in the paper. And we're glad that we did. This design would be far less interesting, and we would have learned less had we been able to pin down its significance. But we nonetheless saw value in probing the limits of paraphrase as a kind of thought experiment to see exactly where and how we failed. And as we have suggested, we failed because our reading of this device both fell short and went beyond it. It fell short in the sense that no one in this room believes that our analysis has captured or exhausted menstruation machines' meanings. The design has relevances and resonances that we have not begun to imagine. So engaging the design reveals the limits of our own perceptual and hermeneutic abilities and even the tacit scopes of our own assumptions as researchers. Our analysis also went beyond the design because it used constraints imposed on us by the design as entry points, not moments of closure. Menstruation machine obviously offers a sort of gender politics, embodies a theory of design research practice, encourages us to think about the meanings of menstruation, and playfully comments on Japanese visual culture. As we became alive to those issues, a broader, range of is a broader range of issues were activated for us. The idea that gendered experiences can be designed. The research question of how design contributes epistemically to our field. And the pairing of a subversive view of gender with an exoticized use of Japanese visual culture. We have argued that design research objects are constitutively indeterminate, potentially inexhaustible, not because they're internally ambiguous, though they may be, but rather because their constitutive indeterminacy prompts, shapes, and also learns from an interpretive dialogue with the movements of thought of their situated interpreting subject. In this dialogue, the subject has what Seal calls experiences of appearing, in which meanings and significance become temporarily and provisionally available to interpretation. This interpreting subject might be the original designer, another designer, or anyone within the HCI community who has an interest in that design. And these dialogues become meaningful to a community 
when many people engage with these designs, even if people don't agree about what they mean. And the community's knowledge advances when the lines crisscross and start to go everywhere, as the designs collectively render their issues as experiences, helping us as a community of interpreting subjects come alive to those issues and think with and through them together. And that was the third aspect of research through design is knowledge unfolding. Knowledge is unfolded in interpretive communities. So by way of conclusion, design knowledge is not just what is encoded in the artifact as a matter of design intention or the history of what, it, what influenced it, although it is certainly that. Whoops. It is also the significance of the engagements that the design is prompted in an interpretive community. Those engagements are constrained but not determined by aspects of the design itself, including intentions and history. For example, it would be odd to offer an understanding of menstruation machine without even mentioning menstruation. But engagements are also openings to read the world through the design, to experience rather than to know, to become alive to what the design prompts us to perceive, to imagine, and to synthesize from our entire stores of experience. And that's what makes them immodest proposals. Uh, we'd like to acknowledge the tough but helpful feedback from Jody for Lizzie, Eric Stoltzman, and our anonymous reviewers. And we also thank the Intel ISTC Social uh, and the Center for Participatory IT at Aarhus University for supporting this research. Thank you. My name is Anirudh Joshi. I'm from the Industrial Design Center, IIT Bombay. Uh, and I wanted to ask if you thought uh, the menstruation machine, is it a piece of design or is it, is it a piece of art? And if you think it's a piece of design, then how far further does it need to move to, be, to qualify as a piece of art? Um, <laughs> there are many layers to that question. Um, <laughs> Uh, however, um, I, <laughs> I'm not even sure where to begin. Um, I, I actually don't, I, I tend not to think that that question is productive asked in an abstract sense. There may be a situation or an institutional context in which that, become, that becomes specifically productive, but asked in a, in a generic way, I actually don't think, um, I don't think it really helps. Uh, I think another way to frame your question maybe is to ask, d does, the, does the kind of interpretive work that we're doing change if we take a design that's less artsy um, and that is more pedestrian? For example, if we were to apply this kind of thinking uh, to Leisha Palin's uh, work on crisis informatics. Um, and I still think a lot of the same issues of the constitutive indes indeterminacy still apply there. Um, but I also think that the, the context and situations of that research and the, and the corresponding designs uh, do in turn uh, raise a number of issues and norms that would, that would obviously shift some of the questions and emphases of this. Well, the ambiguities will tend to collapse as well, that, that are rich in a piece of art which may not continue to stay as rich. It could. Okay. It could. scabs today. Um, <laughs> in this particular case, um, first of all, Ozaki calls it a design fiction. Um, and so I, I went with that, uh, or we rather went with that term in describing her work. Um, but uh, I, I think the question we're trying to address in this work um, in some ways is not specific to, it, it actually gets at issues of thing making and design practices and the ways in which they can um, enrich our understanding in the field. And I think that's, that's kind of the living question right now. Um, and so this didn't necessarily get a, at a level of specificity that would distinguish among uh, those, those practices, which is not to deny their, their significance. <laughs> 